of applause. So, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jula Fora. I'm a data warehouse engineer in the streaming platform team at King. Well, if you didn't raise your hand, uh, meaning that you don't, saying that you don't know about King, it's probably an accident, because I think you probably do. So let me introduce the company a little bit. So King is a mobile gaming company. Uh, it's, it's very famous. Uh, some of our most famous titles are Candy Crush and uh, an another few similar puzzle games. Uh, yes, we have hundreds of millions of players playing the games worldwide across all continents. And yeah, it's a lot of, lot of games, a lot of game rounds played every single day. We get roughly 40 billion uh, in-game events. Uh, every single day. These are events that the games send. So when you play a round of Candy Crush on your mobile phone or your tablet, uh, there are a few things that we track, such as you started your game client, you, you started a game, you made a purchase, hopefully, make us happy, you finished the game. All this information is shortly buffered on the client and then sent to the game servers and we receive them for data processing. So all these games and all these hundreds of millions of players, they generate a lot of data. So I'm not going to talk too much today about standard data warehousing, uh, like batch analytics and so forth. I'm going to focus more on the real-time side of things. Uh, what does this mean? What does all this incoming data mean from, from a streaming perspective? So on the left-hand side, we have the different games producing the events. People play on different platforms. We support mobile, Windows, Facebook, uh, both like Android and iPhone. People play these games everywhere. So all these events that I've mentioned before, they're, they end up on the game servers, and every game server writes it in, in two different places. Uh, first of all, they dump it to Kafka. Kafka is a durable message queue system used mostly uh, for stream processing. We also write events to, to log files that are imported into the data warehouse, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So from Kafka, if we have any streaming use case, we're going to set up a streaming job. You probably have heard about many different uh, real-time processing technologies. You can think of Apache Flink, Spark Streaming, Kafka Streams. These are some of the more popular frameworks uh, today. So you take a framework like that, you, you shove it in, get the data from Kafka, and ultimately you do this to maybe build a new awesome uh, game feature in one of our games, or maybe to just monitor what's happening. Are, is the revenue steam stream steady enough? Is the new release causing like a spike in, in crash rates? And all these kind of things you might want to do, do want to monitor very closely, because even a, a single broken release can lose the company millions of dollars. So let's take a quick step back and look at this application. Uh, so what does a streaming application mean in, at this scale? So you have these hundreds, several hundreds of millions of active players every month. Maybe over a few years, you have probably like billions of unique users, not necessarily meaning that those are a billion actual people, but at least uh, a few billion user identifiers. And if you want to track some statistics on them, this, this can very easily scale in the order of tera like hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes, even for, for very simple use cases where you want to do something based on, on a user level. So we need some some very cool and smart technology to, to tackle this. Uh, fortunately, the, uh, the advancements in stream processing over the last two, three years have made it all possible. But obviously, there are a few ways to do uh, any single thing that we want. It's part of the problem uh, today. So we have a bunch of different uh, streaming applications running uh, at King in production uh, today. So obviously, for, for something very simple, we're not going to run anything fancy. Uh, we try to make it as, as easy as possible. 
So if you're just gonna monitor, uh, I don't know, crash rates or something very simple that is like stateless and stupid, then we'll probably just run a, a simple Kafka consumer or something handmade that can tackle this. Obviously, if you have high availability requirements, uh, the picture gets a little bit more complex, but Kafka consumers are still um, a fairly well, widely used uh, technology, uh, even at the a, at a scale that King has. Another class of applications are obviously real-time dashboards. Think about this as nice, uh, fancy charts in King colors all around the offices. You, you walk around, you look at these night nice graphs, who revenue coming in, everybody happy, uh, draw, like failure rates and like crash rates are, are low, cool. So actually these dashboards are an extremely critical component of the business because this is where most people look for, for insights about what's going on in the games, is everything going fine. It's very important for game teams to know that their games are doing well. A third class of applications are more heavyweight streaming jobs. Uh, they're built on top of Apache Flink. And uh, we, we build a lot of custom tooling, some custom APIs to make stream processing a little bit easier for our developers and make some uh, King-specific things easy to implement. So we, of course, have a bunch of libraries that help uh, deal with King event types. And, but all of these are built on top of Apache Flink. And I guess anybody uh, could do it themselves. Uh, the last thing, and this is going to be the, the focus of this presentation, is our in-house real-time analytics platform, uh, which is the, the easiest way to tap into the, the real-time event streams, either for custom monitoring solutions or even for building more complex, stateful fe in-game features that uh, might end up in the game after some testing. So before going into the details of the streaming platform, let's look at an actual use case uh, of revenue monitoring. My colleagues are always mocking me when I, st when I talk about levels and, and money. Uh, it just shows my very limited understanding of game, uh, gaming industry. But I take this as my take on the word count for this business. So let's say we have Candy Crush uh, going live, and we want to make sure that every level uh, in the game like, produces a steady stream of revenue. We want to just monitor the numbers and maybe alert if something goes wrong. So in an idealistic world of batch processing and SQL, you kind of want something like that on the left. You group by level, and then you sum the amount of money that you earned. Hopefully, it's all in the same currency, so you sum the dollars. And let's say I want to do this every 10 minutes, so I get a continuous update, uh, and if something goes wrong in the next 10 minutes, I still yeah, react it pretty quickly. Uh, so this kind of looks good on paper. There are not many systems can do this uh, right off the bat. Uh, what makes this even more complicated in our use case is that we don't really run with a, a very wide event format. Uh, what I mean by this is that when you make a purchase, the purchase event only says, yeah, Jula made a purchase, uh, this amount of money in this currency. Yeah, good for him. But it doesn't actually say anything about the level uh, I'm playing on. Uh, because attaching this information to every single purchase or other kinds of events would like, really blow up our event pipelines. And instead of receiving like, a few terabytes of data every day, we would suddenly get like, petabytes because we duplicate the data all, of, all over the board. So what we need to do in reality is that uh, for every single user, we need to, we need to track how, like, what's happening when they're playing. So the first time they make a game start, when, we, when they start playing on a level, they, the system sends a game start message. The game start says, yeah, this guy started playing Candy Crush on, on level, I don't know, 2000. We need to store this information that this user is now on this level. And when we actually get a purchase, if we get any, uh, then we need to backtrack and see, yeah, this is the level this user is on. This I can group by on this list level information and add the actual value from, from the purchase event. So this whole idea of 
backtracking and remembering things in the, the, fling, uh, the, in the stream processing context is what people call state and stateful streaming uh, applications. State is uh, some, some information that we accumulate uh, for, di for different parts of the system over the course of data processing. In our case, uh, we accumulate the context, uh, the, the playing context for, for a single user. This is the level they are on. This is the country they are playing from. This, this, this kind of device they are using. And all these different pieces of information, we need to piece together from different event types. And what we get out at the end is we can keep our nice narrow event format. We, we don't blow up the data traffic. And we kind of push this problem to the, to the streaming applications who are now well equipped to handle the stateful requirements that this model uh, requires. All right, so now we have a rough idea what's going to happen. So what does this uh, streaming platform do? So the platform is called Arbea. It's, it's a short for rule-based event aggregator. It's quite a stupid name, but we kind of got stuck with it. You can't really change product names in a company because people stop using it. Uh, the platform is powered by Apache Flink. Uh, it doesn't mean that every single application translates into a Flink job. This is not an API on top of Flink, as you will see later. What it enables is that people can write scripts uh, that can run against the live, you can say, production event streams. So I can go on a web UI, type up a script, maybe get some code completion, and then click on the deploy button, and that fires off a, a production application, uh, so to speak. Uh, the good thing about this, uh, uh, in addition to being super easy, is that it supports a very wide range of features that we get from modern streaming systems, such as window aggregates in event time, not processing time, but based on the events that the players produce, time, things like timer-based callbacks, handling of user sessions, so you can, we can trigger uh, actions when the user session ended after like 15 minutes of inactivity or something. And it also gives a very nice uh, stateful uh, computation, computation model that people can use to build any uh, stateful application that might actually power game features that you encounter when playing uh, Candy Crush. Because it is built on Apache Flink, uh, it inherits uh, the guarantees of, of, the, of the Flink's ecosystem. So by design, it's scalable. We can always increase parallelism if we see that uh, we're struggling to keep up the payload. And also, it's fault tolerant with exactly once processing semantics uh, from, the, from the stateful processing's perspective. Uh, this is guaranteed by the Flink system. I don't really have time to go into the details there, but uh, you're more than welcome to check Flink out later uh, after the presentation if you're interested. So I talked a lot about how cool this is. Let's look at an actually, actual application that one might deploy in production. Uh, I hope, the, I hope the, the text is big enough so that you can read from the, uh, from the back rows as well. So this is a snippet of our Arbea DSL. This is a custom processing language that we created uh, with the goal that it should be easy enough for even uh, data scientists and like, other game developers with very limited data processing knowledge uh, to create these streaming applications and deploy them with a few clicks. Uh, this might look uh, a little bit too easy for, uh, for some of you who are like, like data engineers with a lot of experience, uh, but this is actually very hard stuff for the majority of the people who are actually trying to use real-time analytics techniques. And I think today, the complexity of the pipeline languages and the APIs is one of the, the major barriers uh, for, that keeps us from getting into stream processing at, at many of the companies. So in our DSL, uh, we have a, a very simple annotation-based uh, API. So people can write a simple, this is, by the way, Groovy, if uh, you were wondering. We support Java as well, but for the sake of the presentation, Groovy is easy to show. And if you only know Python, you almost know this. Uh, 
kind of. So we work with annotations. Basically, you write a method, can have any name, and then you annotate it with process event, meaning that this event, th this method will get, uh, will get called for every new event that comes to the system. In part of the annotation, you can specify some filter conditions. In this revenue aggregating use case, we say that, yeah, we only actually care about events that are uh, purchases. SC purchase is like an interface for purchase events. So they, have, they share a schema. So here we define a process method that will be called for, for every purchase event. Uh, we're pretty flexible in the, uh, in the argument list. You can, we support a few different features, and then you can put these container objects in the argument list. You can get the event and some output objects that you can use to create, to write to Kafka, for instance. Uh, you can use aggregators for creating windowed aggregates that we're gonna use for accumulating the revenue, actually. And there's also the state object, which is the, the access point for getting information for, for the past playing history of, this, of the current user. Yeah. So in this case, when we get this script, we see that you're processing this kind of, uh, the purchase events with this argument list. And behind the scenes, when we get this, we will compile it uh, to a Java class, and we actually co-generate a nice uh, strict interface that the backend understands so that after that we don't really care like what argument list you had, it's mapped to a nice uh, interface for us. So let's say the first thing we want to do for every purchase event is, yeah, in addition to aggregate the revenue, we're just gonna pipe all these events to a Kafka topic. In, in Arbea, you can just say output write to Kafka, you specify the name of the topic, and then you also specify the event that should be written to this topic. In this case, we write the purchase to Kafka. All right, it should be written there. We don't care how the system writes it. We kind of assume that this is the production Kafka cluster. Topic name we specified, uh, cool stuff. It should just work. Uh, what happens underneath is that at this point, we're not actually writing anything to Kafka, but we generate in our data flow program an, like a control message that this user from this script wants to write something to this Kafka topic. And we actually have dedicated downstream syncs for, for doing the, the actual writing. So in order to accumulate the level-based revenue, as I said, you need to figure out what level the, the user is currently on. So now we're at the purchase event. Uh, it's time to go back uh, to the last game star that happened and get the level information from there. So we can use the state uh, to get the last uh, ASCII game start event. This is the last game start uh, for my current level. And then I, from this game start, we can get the level information and store it in, in, a, in the current level uh, variable. Last step in our super complicated script is to actually create the increment the aggregator. So in this case, we will get a sum aggregator for adding numbers together. We give it a name, revenue per level, uh, makes sense with 10 minute uh, time buckets. This might be one minute if you wanna test something, but yeah, let's, let's be satisfied with 10 minutes. We'll say group by current level. Uh, note that we, in this case, we pass in the actual level, uh, actual level information to the group. So it's, it's slightly different than a SQL group by where the group by takes a column name. In this case, we actually set the dimension to something but that's, I mean, that's necessary to, to make this work. And then uh, after group by, we add the, the USD amount from, uh, from this purchase. So this is pretty nice and people seem to like it uh, because uh, I would say anybody can uh, get their hands dirty with this, um, even after a few minutes. So we have, running the, we have been running this table since uh, uh, the previous summer. Uh, so it's been over a year now with like completely production uh, uh, experience with this uh, with the system. And it's running live for more than 20 games uh, at the moment. Probably if you play Candy Crush, uh, some in-game features are actually powered by the system. Um, we have different live and QA environments where people can test their scripts if they're not 100% confident that they want to put their first draft into production. But I mean, we're encouraging everyone to, 
to have a free mindset and try things uh, in live. We have hundreds of these R different RBA scripts running. Uh, some of them are quite simple. Some of them actually implement quite com complex uh, in-game features. And all the state that we accumulate with all these like last events and uh, things that people can define in their scripts uh, is actually the five terabytes is uh, slightly outdated number. I would say it's now over 10 terabytes that is uh, live and continuously updated with exactly one semantics that is shared by all these scripts uh, and people can, can work with. All right. So let's actually look at how this works. So maybe uh, you can actually take home something and uh, you can try your own uh, implementation. Uh, by the way, this is not open source, uh, but the only reason for that is, uh, well, we didn't really take the time to make it open source. I mean, we're not secretive about it. I'm very happy to, to talk about implementation details, so don't hesitate to ask concrete questions on how things, uh, these things work. So from a bird's eye view, this is the, the system architecture. In the, the central component uh, is a single Flink streaming job, a single data flow application that executes the, the scripts, that executes this Arbea platform. So not, so uh, I want to reiterate this because this is the, the most distinguishing feature of this, is that whenever you submit a script, it does not generate uh, a new fling job. It doesn't translate into a job like you get the, with these like drag and drop interfaces most of the time. What happens is we actually just send information to an already running job. And uh, uh, basically both events and new script deployments, removals, updates are just events for this complex streaming job that executes uh, all the logic that happens uh, within the scripts uh, inside one static topology by dynamically ingesting and injecting these new scripts, compiling them, cogeneration stuff happening uh, in there. So in the middle, we have a fling job running on top of uh, HDFS, and user states are kept in RocksDB. Uh, that's for people who are familiar with the concept of state backends. Um, it receives the events from the games and executes the scripts on it. And we also have a manager API, uh, which is a REST API, where people can deploy new scripts, and they also, that's where they also query for information about the running scripts. The front end works with this REST endpoint, and whenever you click on deploying a new script, it's pushed to the back end. Actually, it is pushed to Kafka, and the back end picks up the new deployments through Kafka messages. So the Fling job only communicates uh, through Kafka messages. It receives the, the event Kafka topics. It also receives the deployment information. And as an output Kafka topic, it also sends information about the running jobs, uh, like what aggregators are they producing, which Kafka topics are they writing to, and sends this information back to the front end so that we can visualize this. This is the list of running jobs. This job failed. You have an exception in your code. This is the, st the stack trace. This kind of information we need to accumulate about the running scripts so that it is actually uh, usable. So let's zoom in into the, the backend component. Uh, and this is, the, this is the trickiest part. But if you get this, I think you, you understand everything. So from a high level, this main backend job takes two main input streams. First of all, it takes the partitioned event stream. It is partitioned by the users. Uh, we don't, that's, that's how you keep state as well, per key. So we keep state for each user. There's another stream that is the control st stream, which contains information about scripts that are being deployed uh, or scripts that are being removed by the user because they say, OK, I'm happy. I want to stop this job now. The control stream, uh, in contrast with the event stream, is broadcasted. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be able to parallelize the computation. So every single script that is deployed is actually deployed on all the parallel instances that execute the actual processing logic. Uh, so what happens is every time we see we get a new deployment, a new script, so Jula sent this script that does the revenue calculation, please deploy this. This is a message. 
And we get this in every instances, and at that point, we compile the code, generate the classes, and inject this uh, script into this operator. Uh, well, inject is kind of an overstatement. We kind of put it in a list. Uh, that's how you can think about it. Uh, and for every single event that comes, uh, we basically do a simple for loop over all the currently deployed scripts and run them through the process methods. The backend interfaces guarantee that we can like directly call the process methods. And as I mentioned, when people do things like increment aggregators, write things to Kafka from their script uh, through the APIs, uh, they're actually generating output events from this operator so that we can direct the API actions that they execute to, to downstream operators that can actually execute this logic. So every time somebody writes to Kafka, a control message saying, write, please write this to Kafka, goes out and is directed towards a Kafka sync, uh, which only takes care of just pumping those messages into Kafka producers. And this is ex extremely important because if we, would, if we would be executing these like random actions like incrementing aggregators and writing uh, scripts, we would increase, add a huge processing latency uh, to the processing step when, we, when the user code is running. And by transforming the user actions into control messages, uh, we actually can just uh, burst through the scripts and the logic that uh, follows the actions takes place downstream. Uh, for some actions, like incrementing aggregators, doing it in place is pretty much impossible. The only way you would be able to do it is to interact with like a, a transactional database uh, because you're incrementing the same aggregator from multiple places. Uh, that would be very uh, expensive and also you would lose on the exactly once processing guarantees that the systems provide because exactly once only applies for things that happen inside the job. Producing side effects like writing to databases will invalidate uh, the core assumptions. So for aggregators, we also send downstream messages, increment an aggregator called this with this window side for this script that is picked up downstream by a Flink window operator. You can, we create these dynamic time windows uh, from uh, these increment messages, and then at the end, they all end up in Kafka. So why do they all end up in Kafka? So the, you, you would think that aggregators should probably go to like, a database uh, directly from the Flink job. But actually, uh, window aggregates are kind of a, like a very common but painful thing to do once you start doing a lot of them. Uh, if you have a bunch of these uh, streaming jobs, they write to databases and I mean, most, most of you probably run something like MySQL or Cassandra or HBase or some key value store. You're gonna like pipe your, uh, dash, like, your aggregate data into that. But the problem is if you wanna do this directly from the job, that's gonna give you a lot of headaches uh, down the road. So first of all, all these systems will have connection issues, database connection pools fill up, uh, and actually, uh, these gonna like, directly affect the streaming job that actually produces the aggregate. I mean, the poor, fl uh, the poor fling, fling job or streaming job doesn't even know anything about a database, but it's still gonna fail if it can't write to it. So it's actually a very problematic uh, thing to do. Also, you get these constant uh, performance problems with throughput, and of course, you have this duplicated logic in all your streaming jobs, and you fix a bug here, you forgot to fix it there. It's just not a good uh, architecture. So we decoupled the aggregator writing uh, uh, from aggregator. Uh, so we, we tried to decouple the aggregator producing from the actual aggregator storage uh, layer through a system we call aggregato. It's just a, a code name for something very simple. Uh, whenever somebody wants to write an aggregate data point, such as the Fling job wants to write the current level aggregate, it writes a dedicated message to Kafka, which contains the parameters for this aggregate. And then downstream we have uh, a simple Kafka job. It's, it's, not even, it's not even a Fling job. It's just a bunch of Kafka consumers 
that read this aggregate topic, and they, the, the sole responsibility of this application is that it puts things into MySQL. So that's very nice. If MySQL uh, craps itself, then the jobs don't care. The Kafka queue size is gonna little, grow a little bit, and then some other people is gonna fix it, and yeah, it's gonna uh, recover very nicely. Uh, in this model, we only upsert values, so this component doesn't do any aggregation. It takes the latest value for a certain row and updates it in the database. Uh, it also exposes a REST, a REST API so that if we decide to replace the MySQL backend with something uh, like HBase or Cassandra, then we can do this on the backend side and people can still use the REST API to fetch their dashboard data. So it's gonna probably come very handy. So by this time, you're probably were wondering what's the resource cost of running all this, hundreds of scripts, uh, billions of events. It's actually not too bad. So the Flink infrastructure that we're running uh, has of course grown over time. So we started with uh, like roughly six machines. These are, they were pretty small, like 16 cores, like 20 GB RAM and with like slow disks. Uh, the checkpoints, which are the backups for the state data, were stored to a file system called Ceph. Uh, Ceph is very much like HDFS, so you can just, you can do like a mental substitution for the word if you're not familiar with it. Uh, we use Ceph because this is what we got from Ops. It's not, it wasn't much of a choice at that point in time. Uh, so after we, we had our initial prototype set up. Uh, we of course wanted to uh, scale it out a little bit. So we actually got our own like very nice servers uh, with a lot of cores and like hundreds of GBs of RAM with nice two terabyte SSDs. I mean, if you're dealing with your own servers, you probably know that these servers are really cool and it's actually pretty nice to work on them because everything just works. So first we got 12 of them. Uh, and we also moved to, to manage our Flink applications uh, through Hadoop Yarn. We still kept the SAF file system, which ended up causing a lot of issues down the road. So at one point we just completely ditched it and went for, uh, for both like running the Flink jobs on top of Yarn and also storing the data on HDFS on the same machines. So we have very, very nice network connections. And we also doubled up on the servers. Uh, yeah, actually last week we got like another rack of these. So we're continuously increasing uh, our capacity as we see new and um, more and more uh, use cases. For the streaming application management, uh, this, is this is more like a backend consideration, not from the user's perspective, because in, in this platform, we kind of took over the responsibility of running the actual streaming jobs and users just interact with them uh, through our APIs. Uh, but this, this, of course, still means that we run a lot of Flink jobs that need to be, they need to be up and running all the time. Uh, Flink does the heavy lip lifting with uh, awesome features like checkpoints, safe points for storing the state and uh, like updating the code on the fly. Also, res you can rescale applications on Flink without losing exactly one's uh, guarantees. Uh, but uh, of course, on top of what we get from Flink, we added a lot of nice tooling, uh, mostly around like monitoring applications, uh, integrating all this with like continuous uh, deployment. So when we push a fix, uh, it goes to Jenkins and this kind of deployed to a QA environment. Uh, for some time, we were deploying uh, things to production with continuous integration. Yeah, it's not a very nice thing to do. Uh, so we kind of went away from that. Yes. So what else do we need to run these? Well, of course, a bunch of metrics. Uh, we have uh, a lot of dashboards just for us to see what's going on in the back end, how well these user scripts are behaving. Is any of them slow? Is it impacting, impacting the system? What kind of SLA are our internal users getting? Is any application that is user facing <laughs> impacted uh, by this? So we have metrics and alerting systems uh, set up to deal with, this, uh, deal with these problems. So what are these metrics? Uh, well, some of them are 
standard Fling metrics that you get from Fling by default. We also have a lot of custom metrics to track every single thing that happens inside, uh, inside Arbea. So after you send something for processing, we keep track of all your execution statistics for every single script uh, ma like separately. So we know that this script is slow, it uses these kind of features, and this way we get a rough idea on what's going on when things break. Uh, well, things do break, and then we of course sometimes can't really figure out what was wrong even after adding 200 metrics. And then we do some, then we do a lot of CPU profiling as well. Uh, but I guess you can't really get away from these uh, if you run such complex distributed applications. This applies if you're running Flink or Spark or anything. All right. So with this, I would like to wrap up the presentation. Uh, King is hiring. We're looking for people in our team to work on these awesome things. Uh, yeah. So check out our job postings. And thank you very much for listening. All right. That's a good information there. Uh, so before we jump into questions, I just wanted to present to you this token appreciation from Crunch. All right. A little drawing Thank of you yourself much. presenting. <laughs> um, it looks very good. <laughs> yes, yeah, too bad you, people can't see that. Um, so we have a couple of questions here on the screen. Uh, let's start with the top one. How do you handle events generated offline? Uh, well, that's a, that's a good question. So well, the short answer is, uh, well, we can't. I mean, you're playing on, uh, on like the airplane playing Candy Crush. Of course, there's going to be the game client still buffers the events, so the first time you connect to internet after you landed, uh, these events are going to be sent. Uh, yeah, but of course, at that point, it might be completely like late and worthless. So it, it kind of depends on the application logic on how it handles uh, with the late events from the user from users. Otherwise, yeah, you can you can start pushing things to the client to. to uh, to get some offline experience, but uh, I guess that's uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily want to push all this dynamic content to the game clients. I don't think people or Google or Apple would actually be very happy about it. Uh, as a matter of fact. All right. Um, next up, how do you handle analytical needs to join real time with historical data? Yeah. Uh, so in this model. Uh, we work with event streams, and the way we look at historical data processing is that uh, event history is also historical event streams. So we try to capture both historical and real-time processing with the same model. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we run this from the, from the beginning of time. What it means is that we actually have a way to run the same scripts that we deploy on the real-time streams, uh, run it on historical data. We, so in, this, in that case, we actually transform a single script into a single batch job. Uh, this is how we handle it. We don't really ha yet have a very good way of uh, taking the state that you build up from historical processing and putting it in the, uh, in the live stream. Uh, for that, we have a few workarounds so that yeah, you run this historical data processing job, and then you can feed in state through a Kafka topic. So you key it by the user, and then the, your application can pick it up and store it in the real-time stream. These, these are, I guess, are pretty practical uh, for machine learning use cases. It's, it's, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, AI use cases where people take an Arbea script that produces the input features based on the user's player profile, and uh, we take the same exact script to produce the training data for the model uh, that we will later use for prediction, because for both training and prediction, you need to, to create the same kinds of features. Other, that's how these models work. Um, so I think we have time for one more. Um, oh, they're tied now. So I guess you get to be the tiebreaker of the top two. Which one? Yeah. yeah uh, da -da -da -da. Well, I don't know. 
I, I can take the first one. On. <laughs> is is five minutes the actual time remaining? No, because actually we're kind of running late. So. Uh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll take the first one first, and then maybe I take the second one. Okay. All right. Maybe I take I take the second one offline. Perfect. So the first, uh, uh, we are starting to use more and more uh, machine learning to to predict, for instance, like churn. Uh, if, if the user wants to like quit uh, quit, uh, quit playing for uh, uh, yeah for tuning the game as you play if it, if you see it's too hard for you you're struggling making it easier uh, yeah maybe I mean I don't know how many of these features are actually like live in the games um, I'm aware of a lot of use cases similar to this. So there is actually testing happening that, that does exactly this. If some people are struggling a lot on level, some easy level where we see that the average uh, player makes 20 attempts and you're making your, your 50, 50th attempt, you're probably like rage, raging your brains out. We, we might try to help you so that we don't lose you as a player. All right. So for the offline question, will you be around for questions as well? Yeah. Uh, I'll be here for, uh, for a few hours. So. Feel free to grab me and ask anything. Cool. So one last round of applause. Thank you again. Thank you very much. <laughs>